Well, good morning. We're glad that you're here with us and those that are watching on live stream. We're thankful that you're also with us this morning. We are in Daniel chapter 5. We're going to try to again cover an entire chapter in one sitting. Uh, the title of this uh, morning's message is The Writing is on the Wall. It's a, a sort of semi-famous passage in the book of Daniel. And uh, so I hope that uh, if you've studied that you'll remember it. If you haven't seen this before it's uh, pretty interesting We've seen in these chapters up to now, Daniel has come from the land of Israel, Jerusalem, and he was brought to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, who was the supreme leader over, over all the land, uh, from um, uh, all the known lands. It, the scriptures actually say that he was just the the greatest ruler in all of the world, which is amazing. Uh, but we see now, chapter 5, that we've come to a different king. Um, I do believe that Nebuchadnezzar himself, um, after being made to walk a, along the uh, a walk on all fours and become almost like an animal for seven years. To humble him, God did this to him. God raised him back up, and we see that Nebuchadnezzar praised the God of heaven and earth. It's it's very possible. Many commentators believe that Nebuchadnezzar himself became a believer, a strong believer, uh, gave his heart, as we would say, to to the God of heaven and earth, Yahweh. And we will see him in heaven when we get there. So we come to chapter five. And there is a new king on the throne. It um, most likely is not the son of Nebuchadnezzar, but possibly the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. Um, and we'll see that um, this king has a very familiar name, uh, very uh, much like the name Belteshazzar that was uh, the name Nebuchadnezzar gave to Daniel. So, Daniel's Babylonian name was called Belteshazzar, but this king today, very close in uh, spelling, is called Belshazzar, Belshazzar the king. And so, let's read that. We again pray this morning that my voice holds out. It's a little bit better than last week. Uh, barely limped through the sermon last week, but God was gracious and we got through that. So, we're going to pray this morning that we can get through it again without me having um, <clears throat> another coughing fit or anything. So, Daniel chapter 5, the writing is on the wall, uh, beginning in verse 1. Now, Belshazzar the king held a great feast for 1,000 of his nobles, and he was drinking wine in the presence of the thousand. When Belshazzar tasted the wine, he said to bring the gold and the silver vessels which Nebuchadnezzar his father had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem, so that the king and his nobles his wives and all of the women, his concubines, might drink from these vessels. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God, which was in Jerusalem. And the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines drank from these vessels. They drank the wine and they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Suddenly, the fingers of a man's hand came out and began writing opposite the lampstand on the plaster wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the back of the hand that did the writing. And then the splendor of the king's face changed, and his thoughts alarmed him, and his hip joints went slack, and his knees were knocking <clears throat> against each other. The king called out loudly to bring in the conjurers, the Chaldeans, the diviners, the magicians. 
And the king answered and said to the wise men of Babylon, Any man who can read this writing and declare its interpretation to me shall be clothed with purple and have a necklace of gold around his neck and rule with power as third ruler in the kingdom. Then all of the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or make known its interpretation to the king. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed, and the splendor of his face changed further, and his nobles were perplexed. The queen, this would be probably the queen mother, the, the, the king's mother, the, the queen entered the banquet hall because of the words of the king and his nobles, and the queen answered and said to him, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts alarm you, or the splendor of your face be changed. There is a man in your kingdom <clears throat> in whom there is a spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of your father, illumination, insight, and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in this man. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, set him as chief of the magicians, the conjurers, the Chaldeans, and the diviners. This was because an extraordinary spirit, knowledge, and in insight, interpretation of dreams, explanation of enigmas, and solving of difficult problems were found in this man, Daniel whom the king named Belteshazzar. Let Daniel now be summoned, and he will declare the interpretation. Verse 13, Then Daniel was brought in before the king, and the king answered and said to Daniel, Are you that Daniel, who is the one of the exiles from Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah, from Israel? Now I have heard about you, that a spirit of the gods is in you, and that illumination, insight, and extraordinary wisdom has been found in you. And just now the wise men and the conjurers were brought in before me that they might read this writing and make its interpretation known to me, but they could not uh, declare the interpretation of the message but I personally have heard about you, that you are able to give interpretations and solve difficult problems. Now, if you are able to read the writing and make its interpretation known to me, you will be clothed with purple and wear a necklace of gold around your neck, and you will rule with power as the third ruler of this kingdom." Verse 17, then Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts remain with you or give your rewards to someone else. However, I will read the writing to the king and make the interpretation known to him. O king, the most high God granted the kingdom grandeur, glory, and majesty to Nebuchadnezzar your father. And because of the grandeur which he bestowed on him, all the peoples, the nations, and, and men of every tongue feared and were in dread before him. Whomever he wished he, could, he would kill, he killed. And whomever he wished he kept alive, and whomever he wished he raised up, and whomever he wished he made low. But when his heart was raised up and his spirit became so strong that he behaved arrogantly, he, Nebuchadnezzar, was deposed from his royal throne and his glory was taken away from him. And he was also driven away from the sons of men. This is what we looked at last week. And his heart was made like that of beasts and his place of habitation was with the wild donkeys of the field. He was given grass to eat like cattle, and his body was drenched with the dew of the sky until he knew that the Most High God is the powerful ruler over the kingdom of mankind and that he sets up over it whomever he wishes. Yet you, his son, Belshazzar, have not made your heart lowly, even though you knew all of this. 
but you have raised yourself up against the Lord of heaven. And they have brought the vessels of the Lord's house before you and before you and your nobles and your wives and your, your concubines. And they've all been drinking wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze and iron and wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know anything. But the God in whose hand are your life, breath, and all of your ways, you have not honored. Then the hand was sent from him, and this writing was inscribed. Daniel says, now this is the writing that was inscribed, Mini, Mini, Tekel, Upharsin. And this is the interpretation of the message, Mini, Mini, God has numbered your kingdom and put an end to it. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found lacking. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given over to the Medes and the Persians. And then Belshazzar said the word that they clothed Daniel in, with purple and they put a necklace of gold around Daniel's neck and issued a proclamation concerning him that he would now be the third most powerful ruler in all of the Babylonian kingdom. That same night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed. And so Darius the Mede received the kingdom at about the age of 62. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord will last forever. So as we always do, let's go to the Lord in prayer before we get started this morning. Well, Father, you are our good Father, our Lord, our Savior, Creator God, for ever and ever, everlasting to everlasting. We praise your holy name. We honor you. We glorify you. We lift you up. Whatever, Father, we have brought this morning into this room, into our hearts, into our study, we give this to you. Any weights that we have in our heart, any worries, we give all things to you, Father, because you are Yahweh, Elohim, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We worship you this morning. May your name be great in this place. Go with us now as we study your word. Make it real and known to us in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Well, I want you to think to yourselves, if you will, some of the most outrageous ways that you have witnessed where people have tried to challenge the reality and the holiness of God himself. You know, um, in my childhood, uh, I can remember in my teenage years, it doesn't seem that far back but when I count the years, they are getting, there. there's a, a big gulf there between where I'm at today and my childhood. But back when I was a younger guy, um, some people tried to claim attention, gain attention by claiming that there was no God. There was one woman that was a famous atheist and she was always interviewed on TV because she was kind of the one token famous atheist that everybody wanted to talk to because she would say things so outlandish as, there is no God. There is no God. And so, that, that, believe it or not, that seemed just, uh, just far-fetched to most people in our country. These, these people seemed weird to most people. Because especially in the South, many people went to church every week. Even the most godless through the week, uh, uh, doctors, lawyers, Indian chiefs, as we would say, uh, bankers, whoever, but they were at church on Sunday because church was where you kind of connected, where you did business, where you talked about what you were going to do the, in the week with the other men of the, of the town, and so, church was a thing that people did. We, we see today that it is not so much a thing anymore. I don't see that that is a bad thing that so many people are leaving churches because what we're seeing is a removing of the unsaved, the removing of the, the godless. Uh, God is separating, you know, the wheat from the chaff. 
And we're, we're seeing in these latter days um, who really is the true follower of God and who, who is not and who was just playing games. But to watch the news today, uh, you would almost think that the entire world has become an atheist. Atheists are at least agnostics. You know, atheists say there is no God. There's, there's nothing there. An agnostic um, simply would not care whether there is a God or not. Uh, a great reason for concern in our culture today is that it is clear that many people seem to have elevated themselves to, to a deity in their own life. They have decided that they are their own God. They will answer to no one. They have set themselves up as the God of their own domain. Now, they may not call themselves a God. That, even at this point, that would seem kind of weird, but some people do. Um, a few years ago, uh, there was uh, a man on the Appalachian Trail that um, was really uh, off in the head. Uh, you would have to be to do this, but he began, you know, on the, on the AT, on the Appalachian Trail, everybody that hikes the trail, they, they come up with their own nickname for themselves. Um, uh, I think my brother-in-law, I think he, he called himself Sasquatch or something. It was just, you know, people come up with um, just different names. Um, and it's a fun thing to do. Um, but this particular man who was middle-aged man called himself Sovereign. And he ordered everyone on the trail to call himself Sovereign uh, Leader. Well, he, you, when you're on the Appalachian Trail, you come to areas that are up, um, you know, miles and miles away from civilization, but they're up on, a, up on the trail, up on the mountaintop, and it's a clearing, and it's where many people will set up their, <clears throat> their tents for the night. You'll get there, and there'll be a number of different people that have just made their way to kind of this area. There are many, many areas like this. And uh, if you get to an area and you say, well, it's about 3.30 or 4 in the afternoon, I better find a place to set my, uh, my tent. Well, other people have done the same thing. And you'll find yourself kind of in a little um, miniature campground with other people that you don't know. Uh, but they're also hiking the AT and everybody has their own little fire or their food. And, and you kind of talk to people. You get to know them, where you're from and how long you've been on the trail. And it, it's really fun. But this particular uh, time that this man was on the trail, he got to this camping area and everybody could see that he was pretty different, pretty odd, and becoming pretty aggressive. Before the evening was out, before the, the night was over and dawn had come, he had stabbed uh, at least one or two people. One had died. One person was stabbed so bad by this madman, they ran t uh, a good 10 miles in the dark with no flashlight all the way down the trail till they could get to a ranger station and have somebody go back up the trail to, to get this guy. All that to say, uh, it, it did work out. They, they captured the man, but he called himself Sovereign. Because truly, in his mind, he had made himself God, and he felt that he could take life as he chose it. But people today, we we've, we've see this on, on social media also, people are demanding now to be seen, to be seen. And now, it's not a new thing because it's human nature for probably since Adam and Eve that people want you to notice them. They, they don't, no one wants to just be shoved over to the side and no one cares about you. We, we want to be cared about. But some people, it seems like, uh, are setting themselves up to be seen on social media now. We call this a social media influencer where the more followers they have, the, the greater they are. And they do everything they can to gain followers. And they have begun to do 
just crazy outlandish things. They're filming themselves, videotaping themselves, doing whatever just to get clicks and to get people to click. And the more clicks they get, maybe they get some money from it, but they get recognized also. <coughs> they demand to be recognized. What we're seeing is people today, young men, young women, even older men, sometimes older women, look at me. Look at me. I want you to look at me. This is what they're saying. They want a name for themselves. And what we're seeing now is they will stop at nothing to do something outlandish to get noticed. And what's even crazier is they might even go as far to, uh, far, uh, to do something to change their gender just for shock value. And then they say, uh, now, are you looking at me now? Because I've changed from a boy to a girl or a girl to a boy, or I've changed from uh, a woman to a man. Hey, are you looking at me? Because I want your attention. What we're seeing in our culture is the opposite, complete opposite of Christianity. Christ followers do not do this. Christ followers should honestly not even say, look at me. Christ followers, what do we do? We say, look at him. Everything that I do, I want you to look at him. Look at God. Look at Jesus. Turn your eyes to the Holy Spirit. We don't praise ourselves we praise Him. That is what we are called to do our entire lives once we come to know Jesus as our Savior. It's not about me. We should say, I don't even want you to look at me. I don't want to gain any attention. Some of the great reformers of the uh, Renaissance, the Middle Ages and the Enlightenment and so forth were such godly men and women that they, they didn't even want their graves to be marked. They were like, I want you to bury me in an unmarked grave so that no one will know where I'm buried and I am gone from this earth. Now, they knew that they would be with the Lord in heaven forever. They didn't want praise on themselves. Galatians 2.20 says this, Paul wrote this to the letter to the Galatians in his letter to them, I am crucified with Christ and it is no longer that I live, but Christ that lives in me. For the life that I live in this flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself up for me. Um, I've loved that verse for uh, almost 30 years now when I was made to memorize it uh, during Master Life when we were taking that at uh, Shades Mountain Baptist Church so many years ago. And I've repeated that hundreds of times over. I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer me that lives. Well, Scripture is filled with accounts of pagan kings who were full of themselves. We see even uh, people today, it, it can be the lowest little pipsqueak mayor of a little town all the way up to the, a president or a, a king of another country. Uh, we uh, know of people who are full of themselves and they need to be brought low by the Lord. This morning we see that it was a literal hand, a literal hand that was by itself. <clears throat> there was no arm attached to it. How this worked and what it looked like, I can only imagine. But it was the literal hand that provided a writing on the wall. Um, it was the the writing on the wall in the palace of the king of Babylon. This, uh, this palace probably looked like this. I think we've got this picture online. I've showed you this a couple of weeks um, in the past, but this is what Babylon, an artist drawing, <clears throat> would have looked like. The palace. And inside of something like this was where Nebuchadnezzar 
and now Belshazzar were, were king, but also where Daniel served the kings. And in a palace that was probably a lot like that, this is where the literal hand appeared that began writing on the wall. Chapter 4 was the last time we said that we heard from the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, and in chapter 5, through a series of events, we see that Nebuchadnezzar has died and a new king is, has been put on the throne, but faithful Daniel is still here. And he is serving this new king as a prophet and a wise man. And you would have to believe that Daniel was probably in his 40s or 50s. He might have even been in his 60s by now. He's no longer that teenager that was brought over as a captive to Babylon from his home in Jerusalem. And Daniel also had a front row seat to view history as it was being unfolded or as we might say, as prophecy was being unfolded. And as we continue in these next uh, number of weeks, we're going to get deeper and deeper into the prophecy of the end times, which is extremely uh, important to us and also interesting. And we're going to see that this prophecy that, is, that Daniel is going to foresee is our future. So you remember that first frightening dream that Nebuchadnezzar had of the massive statue of a man. I think we've got a picture of that also. Remember the statue was about 90 feet tall. Nebuchadnezzar had seen this statue and no one could interpret what it meant. But they brought Daniel in and he told them that this is what the statue uh, means. Um, it was not a real statue, but it was a statue that uh, Nebuchadnezzar had seen in his dream. Remember, the head was made of fine gold, the chest and arms were silver, the stomach and the thighs were bronze, the legs were iron, and the feet were iron and clay. <coughs> now remember I said that Daniel interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream to mean that Nebuchadnezzar represented the head of fine gold. But the next great conqueror of the land, Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar, he said, Nebuchadnezzar, after you, after your, your kingdom dies, after your son, your grandson is on the throne, another king from another nation is going to come in, and those are going to be the Medo-Persians. Well, the Medo-Persians were the silver, as you're moving down, in, on the statue, the, the arms and the chest were the Medo-Persians. And this is exactly what we see happening in this morning's section of Daniel chapter 5. In fact, as the events of Daniel chapter 5 take place, as we read that, that uh, Belshazzar is in his palace, they're having a great massive party what's happening outside the gates of, and put the, put the other picture back up of the, uh, the palace, what's happening outside the gates of the palace is that the Medo-Persian general and king are out there and they have already laid siege to Babylon and the palace. We know that this is true because this is history. We even know the dates that it happened. And so, as Chapter 5 is happening as this party is being had by Belshazzar. The Medo-Persian and the army is right outside ready to come in. So we wonder, well, why would Belshazzar have a party? Was he, was he one either saying, hey, they're about to come in and conquer us, uh, you know, tonight we die, so let's party now. Or was he thinking, our, our defenses are so impenetrable that there is no way the Medo-Persian army outside that gate can get in. And so we're going to show them that they cannot get in. We're going to have a party inside here while they're outside. They're not coming in. We don't know either which one it was. But what we know is that Belshazzar began to have um, basically, uh, you know, a sex party. 
an orgy that he's having with all of the people, the, the important people of Babylon. Uh, to make things even a little bit more confusing, this new king's name, as I said, is Belshazzar, which is very close in name to Belteshazzar, which was Daniel's name when he was a teenager. So, Belshazzar had become king in Babylon after Nebuchadnezzar. We've got all of that down pat. And we see that Belshazzar, the king, has this massive feast. It says in verse 1, for 1,000 of his nobles. And he was drinking wine in the presence of the thousands. So, they're, they're all getting drunk and they're tasting this wine. And then Belshazzar says something that is almost beyond belief. He's, it, it's as if he thinks of something even more crazier than he's ever thought before. And he says, where are the cups that my grandfather stole out of the holy temple in Jerusalem? This is the temple that Solomon built that was in Jerusalem that Nebuchadnezzar had burned down and taken all of the cups and saucers and stuff back to Babylon with him. And Belshazzar, the king, says, where are those cups? Where are those golden so-called holy cups that came from the temple in Jerusalem? Bring those to me. And all the people, we're going to drink from them. And all of the women that we're, uh, everyone is having this sex party with, they're going to drink from them too. And we're what was happening was it was blasphemy against a holy God of heaven because they were drinking from these holy vessels that they had taken out of the temple. It meant something to God. And so, that night Belshazzar is judged. He is judged by God and God sends a hand, a literal hand to... <coughs> The writing on the wall, Belshazzar, tonight's your last night to live. And so it says, suddenly the fingers of a man's hand came out and began writing opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And then the, the splendor of the king's face changed and his thoughts alarmed him. It says that his, his hip joints went slack, his knees were knocking. Uh, Instead of boosting morale with a wild party, now Belshazzar is shaking with fear. He's shaking with fear because he has now seen something sent to him by the God of heaven. So, Belshazzar did what all the kings before him had done. They, they, when they can't explain something, they call in all the wise men, the magicians, the soothsayers. You know, it's what ungodly people do. They start trying to figure out what's happening without consulting God's Word, without consulting God's holy people. They look for earthly answers to heavenly experiences. Do, do we do that when we have been visited by God or, or experienced something from God's own hand? Do we start trying to figure out earthly answers, or do we recognize God is trying to get my attention? So, here's a lesson for us this morning. The wisdom of the world cannot understand the things of God. Atheists, agnostics, all unbelievers always seek to explain away, just explain away God's great power Verse 8, then all the king's wise men came in and they could not read the writing on the wall or make its interpretation known to the king. And then Belshazzar was greatly alarmed and the splendor of his face changed. He is scared to death. He's, he has seen a, a vision, a, a thing from the Lord. But it, it says that the queen mother apparently stepped in. She is she has no great authority in the kingdom, but they treat her as royalty because she must be um, the, the grandmother um, to, or the mother of the king that is currently sitting there, Belshazzar's mother. And she says, there is a man, there is a man, there is a man in your kingdom in whom 
the Spirit of God is in. Don't, wouldn't you want people to say that about you? Whenever there is something going on, there's a spiritual need, there is a, a calamity, there is a death, there's um, maybe a celebration, a wedding. Wouldn't you want people around you to know or say this about you, there is a man that knows God that can tell us the things about God. There is a woman that knows God personally that can tell us the things about God. Wouldn't you want um, maybe your grandchildren, uh, if they're talking to their mother and daddy and they don't have an answer about something in the Bible, uh, wouldn't you want your grandchildren to say, well, let's ask grandmother. She knows about the Bible. Let's ask mom. She knows about the Bible. Let's ask dad. There is a man. He knows the Bible. Let's ask him. I, you know, I want to be that kind of person. Um, to live a, a quiet, unassuming life, but to know Scripture so well that if someone needs an answer from Scripture, maybe somebody at work, they'll say, what do you think about what does this mean in Scripture? Because I know that you are a, a Christian. And so it says in verse 11, there is a man and the Spirit of God is in him. And this was because an extraordinary spirit, knowledge, insight, interpretation of dreams, explanation of enigmas, solving of difficult problems were found in Daniel. It's interesting that Belshazzar didn't call Daniel <clears throat> at first. He called in all the wise men. But it was the older woman in the family who said, you know what, I kind of remember a guy. There's a guy that your father, your grandfather used to call when he had things that he could not answer. His name was Daniel. And so Belshazzar says, let Daniel be summoned and he will declare the interpretation. And I love that. In, in all the darkness of the previous verses, Daniel's name now is mentioned just like a breath of fresh air. Daniel comes in and brings God's, God's um, countenance in with him. Daniel's godliness cuts just you know, right through this debauchery, this vileness that is happening in this, this, this terrible party. And it says in verse 13, then Daniel was brought in before the king and the king answered and said, are you that Daniel? I don't know if your, your uh, translations say that, but mine says, are you that Daniel who is the one of the exiles from Judah whom my father, the king brought from Judah? You know, are you that guy? You're that guy that knows scripture so well that you, you, you speak to God regularly and look, the world may not respect you as a Christian, as a Christ follower. Um, there have been times in my life when I worked in secular jobs where the people of the office kind of all got together, and I found out about it later, that they all got together for a party that weekend or something at somebody's house. And I wasn't invited. And I realized the reason I wasn't invited is because even as a younger guy, I had spoken of the Lord a good bit in the office. And they were kind of like, I guess they thought, we don't want to involve David. He's a church guy. We don't want to involve him in our party, which I kind of like that. I want to be known as a person like that. So the king promised these great riches to any of the wise men that could interpret this writing on the wall. And Daniel was in, in uh, a given, um, you know, offered all of these riches if you can interpret this writing. Now, the riches did not matter to Daniel. Well, first of all, it didn't matter to Daniel because he wasn't about all the riches and the trappings of, of the kingdom of Babylon. Also, secondly, Daniel knew what was outside the gates of Babylon. He knew that the Medo-Persian army was there that very night and that this would be the last night of the king's life. He says, Daniel, in verse 17, let your gifts remain with you. Let your gifts remain with you. I, I don't need your gifts. 
my relationship with the Lord God of heaven is, is good enough for me. This, th- those are my treasures, is what he was saying. But Daniel went on to explain to this king that God had dealt hard with King Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel kind of wanted to say, Belshazzar, don't you remember any of the family talking about your grandfather Nebuchadnezzar kind of going crazy for about seven years and that it was the God of heaven that did that to him? And that the God of heaven kind of grabbed him by the shirt collar and said, look, I'm, I'm God. You must honor me and glorify me. And Daniel is saying, Belshazzar, don't you remember that? The stories that have been handed down? And God had made Nebuchadnezzar low by making him walk on all fours. And what had happened is God had taught Nebuchadnezzar a lesson about God's sovereignty. And he says in verse 22, yet you, Daniel is saying this to the king, yet you, his son, Belshazzar, have not made your heart lowly, even though you knew all of this. You knew this story about your grandfather. You knew how God had come to him and made him a, a, a holy man before he died. And yet you have decided to live your own way. And here you are with this, this sex party going on, and you're drinking out of the holy vessels that had come from God's holy temple in Israel, and you've thought nothing of it. And so he says in verse 23, King, you have raised yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You've brought these vessels from his house, and you've, you've let your nobles and your wife. Here it is when he begins. You've got to read through the, uh, between the lines here. He's saying, you've let all your prostitutes drink out of God's holy vessels. And then you have drunk from these gold and silver vessels, and then you have started praising the gods of the gold and the silver and wood and bronze and stone. And these gods, of course, are, they are nothing. They do not see or hear or know, he says. But the God in whose hand is your very life breath. And in all your ways, you have still not honored Yahweh. And the thought here is this. Daniel, at this point, giving the king a bad report about the king himself, a reprimand. See, the king was getting reprimanded by this this wise man, Daniel. Daniel could have been killed on the spot right then for speaking to the king like this. He might have known it. Today, I am being summoned before the king. I will speak truthfully to him. If I die today, I will go to be with Yahweh in heaven forever. But today might be the day that I die. But Daniel said, regardless, I still speak the truth. I fear no man. Daniel continued, verse 24, So, king, the hand of God was sent. And the writing was inscribed as this way, Mini, Mini, Tekel, Uparsin. And, you know, that sounds odd to us. But Daniel interpreted the writing on the wall this way. We see that Mini meant counted or appointed. And it's written twice for emphasis. Tekel means weighted, as in it is God who weighs a person's actions. And every person that has ever lived on the face of the planet is weighed by God. Now, we've all been weighed by God, and we've come up short. Every single person ever born on the face of the planet has come up short because of our sin. But it is God uh, who has sent Jesus, and those that have trusted in Jesus as Lord and Savior, now we are appointed, we are weighed And now because Jesus is our weight, we are weighed correctly and honorably and we are forgiven of our sins. A parson means division or divided. 
And so the words taken together in the phrase means this, numbered, numbered, weighed, and divided. He told the king what the writing on the hand, the writing on the wall, the hand, what it said is numbered, numbered, weighed, divided. And that really is our, that is what everyone that has ever lived that faces God's judgment, if they have not known Christ, what they are going to hear is numbered, numbered, weighed, divided. Sir, you've come up short. Ma'am, you were before God's throne. You have come up short. And at that point, it's too late. Only with Christ as our Savior will we know that we have been taken care of by the blood of the cross. It's interesting that in 1 Samuel 2, verse 3, it says, The Lord is the God of knowledge, and by Him actions are weighed. The Lord is the Lord of knowledge. By Him actions are weighed. Numbered, numbered, weighed, divided. Belshazzar, you have been numbered, numbered, weighed, divided. God has looked at your humility and you've come up short according to the God of heaven and earth. And so that very night, Daniel's words were fulfilled. <clears throat> Just hours after this very scene, Belshazzar's kingdom fell to Darius the Mede. We know that. The history books will tell you that. We even know the exact date for this, October the 29th, 539 B.C. This is when this all happened, that very day. So sometimes it looks like ungodly people are getting away with murder. And God's people are suffering. But know this, that God is always watching even in chapter 4, we saw that God was called a watcher. Last week, we were told that God is a watcher. God is watching everything. He sees everything that we are doing in our lives. So, here's how we can apply what we've read this morning in Daniel chapter 5. Daniel was a prophet, and it was a special calling placed on his life by God. But all Christians are given special abilities at certain times to speak righteous words. The Bible tells us this, and we see that Daniel did not shy away from speaking the truth. I think that's what, what we're called to do. You know, we need jobs. Uh, we need, you know, many people go to secular jobs. You have an office you go to. Some people are concerned about keeping their job. You know, I can't say anything real Christian-y in the office because, you know, people, they don't like that. I get made fun of. I may have a boss that doesn't um, care anything about holy things. He might even be an atheist, call himself an agnostic. You best not say anything, you know, holy, biblical to, you know, people in the office. Or would you fulfill your calling, maybe God has put you in that office to do the very thing that you're called to do, which is to speak His name. Well, what if I get fired? Well, you might get fired, but your job was to go into the office and speak the, the words of God there. There are many jobs that you can have. God will give you another job. I mean, Matthew tells us this, that we should not worry about what we wear. We should not worry about what we eat. God takes care of the birds. God clothes the flowers of the field. God will take care of us. But you only have one life to live. And you would hate to get to heaven. Yes, you're Christian. Yes, you're going to go into the gates. You're, you're saved by Jesus. But Jesus says, before you enter into my rest for eternity. Uh, let's, let's go over your life. And I want to show you a couple places here where you could, you, could have really, you could have really hit a home run here. And I was setting you up for it. But it looks like right here you were afraid to speak my name in public. You were afraid of what might happen. And you let it go. And that was some unfaithfulness in your life. Well, 
That could be said for everyone. That could be said for my life and your life. I, I think of a couple of times just in the last couple of years where um, someone from a, a, a co totally different religion asked me about Jesus. And f at the moment, I just kind of skipped right over it. And instead of realizing that that was my opportunity to really tell her about Jesus. And I, I worry about it. I fret some. I I just think, Lord, if you'll give me that opportunity again, I'll, I'll try not to make a mistake. We all do that. We worry about what we, were, we are going to say many times. And, and here's the last thing I'll say. Don't worry about what you will say. Wake up every morning and say, to the best of my ability in Christ, I will, I will be God's man today. I will be God's woman today, wherever I'm at. And Lord, I, I'm not going to worry about exactly getting it right, what to say and what not to say. I'm going to do the best I can. And we know this is true because this is Scripture right here as I close with this. Matthew 10, 19. But when they hand you over to the courts, Matthew writes, uh, he's talking to the church, talking to believers, do not worry about how or what you will say. For what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. God is faithful. If you were there and you just say, God, I may not say it the exact right way. I may, I may get the, 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 the gospel presentation just completely mixed up. But I want to be your hands and feet in this world. I want to tell people about Jesus in the office, at the grocery store, ball field, wherever that is. Help me to be faithful. Sometimes I can't even give people the four spiritual laws or the Roman road or anything like that. All I can say is Jesus is faithful. Turn to Jesus. Jesus is faithful. Turn to Jesus. And the Holy Spirit will do his work if you'll do yours. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for your goodness and your grace to us, your peace. We have so much to be thankful in this country Again, we ask that you would cover the election process that will happen this week. Uh, Lord, we know that there are many shenanigans that Satan has placed um, in the road for God's people. We pray, Father, for this country. We pray for your church, that your church would be a light in darkness. Father, we don't place our faith in a man uh, or an office. We don't place our faith even in the president. We place our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross to save us from our sins. Father, help us to be your men, your women, your boys and girls that, that we will be solid. We will be like a Daniel who was not flashy and he didn't care about flashy and, and shiny things, but he cared about representing the Lord God of heaven in an honorable way. And for that reason, we talk about Daniel even to this day. Father, make us Daniels. Make us strong in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen.